Good morning. Today is Wednesday, October the 31st. Happy Halloween. Good to see you're all in costume. Right? What's on your mind? Oh, I should have mentioned that. That's a big deal thing out here. Yeah, yeah there'll be several, several thousand kids, I think, going through that. It's pretty popular. Have any of you been to the zoo and taken a little tour through there? Ever had a look around? It's a worthwhile, you know, visit and see what's there, see what the program's about. Very unique program in zookeeping. Anything else going on? Anything in the news? Tuesday next week is election day, but if you vote before then, you'll probably be able to get in and out of the booth without too long a delay. Anything about the exam? Well, thank you for explaining that. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I, have, I just made a note to myself to go back into Connect and make sure I leave it open there for the extra day or it would have closed early. Imagine that, me making a mistake. I did want to bring a couple of things to your attention about the exam. First one is I posted the Monday class video. And Monday in class, we did a number of sample problems like you might see on the exam that were excerpts. So you didn't do the entire Keynesian model. You were just given certain parts of it and told to calculate this or explain that. And so that class video, if you haven't seen it, this is mostly for folks online, maybe, you damn sure want to watch that. In fact, I think that since exam two, since all the material for this exam is that material on Canvas, that is exactly what we've been doing in class too. And so I think the class videos are just as important as anything else you're going to get, get or use to get ready for the exam. Um, but in addition to what we've talked about so far in class, which, which was the chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11 on Canvas, there are a couple of other readings in there as well for this exam. One of them concerns, and we'll make a list over here to the side if I can, one of them concerns the accelerator effect. And one of them concerns the Great Depression. And as I was putting the exam together, I went back to those articles and pulled out some questions based on those readings as well. Anything else that's on there? Anything, anything in Canvas for exam three? Okay. Anything. Um, the World War II reading. The World, World War II reading. Explain to me. I, I don't the, remember it by that. It's eight pages. That's as much as I got. It talks about the recession. How relevant is that to the exam? Because it seems like most of the Connect stuff is um, focused on like um, economics. Yeah, and it's just kind of a story that you wrote. I wonder if I had a martini and posted it by accident. Let's see here. Do you remember more or less what was in the article? Okay, I appreciate that because I'm drawing a blank right now. I tend to remember things by certain titles, though. It you know, makes me a little handicapped. Um, okay. So make sure you do in the readings. Make sure you go back to the classical model, the Keynesian explanations and refutation, as well as the algebraic model and the calculations and manipulations and such as that. Okay. Um, Sample question. You're given G is equal to 86, taxes are equal to 95, transfers are equal to 5. The economy is, has a recessionary gap of 200. 
Tell me what's going on with the budget, the federal budget in this model, based on these pieces of information. Is What is the budget status, and is it appropriate to the situation? That's what I'm talking about here, the Great Depression. What it has is about six contributing factors that, when combined, led into and created, if you will, the Great Depression of the 1930s. And yes, you want to read that very closely. See, I didn't remember it as World War II, just the terminology. I'm glad you brought it up, though. All right, what's going on with this government budget on the board? The government is, um, has a greater revenue than what they're putting into the economy. Okay, their revenue is taxes. Their disbursements are taxes, I'm sorry, spending plus transfers, which would be 91. As a result, they have more revenues than they have disbursements. What do we call that? Surplus. A surplus. They are running a budget surplus where their revenues exceed their disbursements. Is this the appropriate budgetary policy in the Keynesian model, the appropriate budgetary policy for a recession? Everybody signed in on the seating chart? Good deal. Thank you, sir. Now, in Keynesian terms, what's, what is the cause of a recession? Keynes blames everything, inflation or recession, on one major variable. What is it? Spending. If there's a recession, what's going on? There's not enough spending. In the Keynesian terms, the Keynesian would tell you, well, there's a, a, a deficiency of spending. Not enough spending. And we know what his fiscal policy prescription would look like generally, right? What would they be? Fiscal policy. Cut taxes, raise spending, some combination thereof. But what about a budget surplus. Do you want to be running a budget surplus when an economy is in recession, according to Keynes? No, because why? Well, first and the easiest thing to remember is if it's a recessed or depressed economy, he always suggests a deficit, which means put more money into the economy than you're taking out. Right here we are what? We're putting less money in than we're taking out, so we are acting as a drag on the, on the spending flow in the economy. So he's going to say that the surplus is not appropriate for a recession. You should be considering a deficit instead. But again, kind of an example of limited data with a particular question, but based on everything we've done in the model. Okay? Your comments, your questions, anybody? We're not, yes. going to, we're not going to get one big problem just to work out like that has everything. No, so. I'm not going to give you one huge problem, but you're going to think you've been doing one by the time you're done. <laughs> Depending on your luck of the draw, because I've got a pool of about 80 questions, and you're going to get about 35 of them, but you're not going to get the same 35. So you may see a whole lot of something and nothing of the else, you just don't know. Let's look for a moment at the accelerator effect. I'm going to kind of plot on the board um, GDP, real. Actually, I'm going to plot that on the horizontal, on the vertical axis. GDP growth rate. against time. And we look at, what are we going to be looking at here? We're going to be looking at the business cycle, the ups and downs in the economy. 
And again, this is going to be part of the accelerator effect discussion. What do we know happens in the economy? Typically, we have positive growth rates, and then we have slowdowns and even negative growth rates. Something like that. But instead of calling that GDP for a minute, let's call that consumption spending. Because we know consumption spending is a dominant factor out there. Do you see a recession on that graph? Where do we show a recession? When you have negative growth for two quarters. If this period of time was two quarters or more, that would have been a recession. But here's where the accelerator comes into effect. This is consumption spending and businesses, and, and particular, particularly businesses that manufacture durable goods. We've got to do better than that. What do you suppose a durable good is? Boy, it's just not my day. Durable good. What does the term durable mean? It lasts a while. Durable goods. If we look at the businesses that make durable goods like appliances, automobiles, that sort of stuff, remember that our economy used to be much more dependent upon products than services. Today we're much more service driven. That makes this a little bit less relevant, but still relevant to what's going on. We look at the businesses that produce durable goods, and what are they watching? They're trying to determine how many automobiles should we make next quarter. And so everything in business starts from the forecast of your sales. How do you think sales are going to do? If sales are going to boom, we've got to get with our suppliers, make sure we've got plenty of raw materials. We've got to build up our inventories to be ready to meet that demand, okay? We have, may have to hire more employees, a lot of planning to do. So as we're looking at the future, durable goods, what we're really closely focused on is how are consumers spending money? What's been happening with consumer spending lately? Anybody know? It has taken off. It has really been driving the economy, okay? And report last week, wages have finally started to grow at a, recent, at a decent rate, which, which makes sense, right? How are you going to spend more money if you ain't got more income? So the economy is looking particularly strong in terms of consumer spending and incomes right now. What does that mean for you if you're making automobiles? Say again. You're making bank. You should be prepared to sell lots more cars, which means now you've got a little bit of a lead time, you know? I go down to my factories and I say, okay, start producing more cars. How long is it going to take until they've built my inventories up? Well, it's going to take a while, so there's a little lag. But here's what happens. When consumption spending starts going up, businesses start getting optimistic. And depending on the time scale here, what you see is they tend to grow their investment spending, and that's what we're showing in purple here. They tend to overestimate because their thinking is, what, is, what if this is the beginning of a huge growth period? I've got to be ready to meet that, but we're down here, or maybe we're just right here today, and we're saying things are looking good. We, does that mean it's going to continue in the future? We don't know, but what's the worst thing that could happen? We don't, we don't produce enough cars. People go out and they keep buying and spending goes up and we run out of stock. We run out of inventory. What does that do to you in car sales? I come into your Ford dealership and I say, I need a Ford 150 and you say, well, they're on back order. It'll take you 30 to 60 days to get one. What do you think I'm going to do? <laughs> Where's the damn Chevrolet dealer? I'll teach you people. And if they forecast correctly, I'm going to buy a Chevrolet, and now what? <laughs> I tend to agree with you. But if I like my Chevrolet, 
I'm going to drive it for at least, on average, at least three years before I come back to the Ford dealership. And if I really like my Chevrolet, I'm never coming back to the Ford dealership. So you see what happens if you run out of inventory. Same thing for appliances, okay? So business spending, investment, recall, tends to exaggerate whatever this trend seems to be right now because they don't want to run out of inventory. But then suppose you've produced more inventory, you've gotten up here, and then the damn consumer starts slowing down spending and we slide into a recession. Now what are you afraid of? I'm going to have so damn much inventory, it's going to be sitting out there, that's all my money tied up, it's going to be losing value, deteriorating. So what do you do about production and investment spending? You exaggerate the downturn. You say stop everything, cut the presses, you know, stop producing nothing and you tend to overestimate because the worst thing that can happen is this is the beginning of a long depression you damn sure don't want a lot of trucks then when it turns back around you think a hot damn we're in we're in good times again you see what i'm talking about with an exaggeration it's why they call it an accelerator effect a small movement of your foot causes a 2,000 pound vehicle to enormously accelerate or not accelerate. And so we get this kind of uh, exaggerated, I'm going to draw it in red anyway, whatever C is, I tends to be same pattern but exaggerated. So this is investment spending. You okay with that? And it's because we're constantly worried about either running out of inventory in the good times or having too much inventory in the bad times and so we tend to overdo our production. What do we know happens when there is a change in investment spending? We know that it is subject to a multiplier effect. Remember that? Just like government spending. Which means that the change in aggregate demand or spending overall is going to be even wider and so if this was C and this was I what would GDP look like? It would be even more exaggerated. Okay? GDP might take fluctuations like that. And I'm exaggerating this a little bit to make the point but what am I really saying? The economy. The economy is highly unstable. This is the Keynesian view. What happened? You remember what the classical view would have been on this? We get minor fluctuations in aggregate demand and we automatically correct back to full employment. So these kinds of wild gyrations in the economy are probably not going to be much of a factor. They're going to be very short run and not nearly so wide because the economy is going to self-correct. Keynes says, oh no, we have a very volatile economy that is subject to real wide fluctuations in spending. And it's these huge drops that we want to try to preclude or at least in some way mitigate so they're not so bad. And so we have again the argument of classical side. Don't interfere with the market, it'll adjust itself quickly and things will be smooth. Keynes side saying, uh-uh, you better do something to fix it. Fiscal policy, my, my solution. Okay, so far? So this is the accelerator effect. Not as important now because we're, what, 70% durable or 70% services on our economy now? But if you went back to the 40s and 50s and 60s, where we were dependent upon producing a lot more products, could be a problem. Maybe this gets to be a problem for your generation, millennials, why? Because as millennials reach that age and start forming families, what's going to happen to the demand for appliances? It's going to increase. What's going to happen to the demand for vans, family cars? Okay, it's going to increase. That's sort right. Of Just like after World War II and the baby boom. Depending on the makeup of, in this case, the age makeup of the population, you may see more or less of an accelerated effect, more or less of a demand on durable goods. But again, the background is this, is this is part of an explanation by Keynes 
and the Keynesians on why the economy is unstable and we need to regulate it, control it, manage it. Okay? Questions? If there's a generation of people that don't necessarily create families at such a rate that they used to, how does the the, how does the producer hold out until the next generation that needs appliances? And it becomes, a, a, well, we, in economics we use the term deep pockets. Which producers have the most money in the bank that they can wait it out or diversify into other areas? If you're really big at making appliances, can you maybe in some way shift that over and make drones? pick up a defense contract making drones or something, and you, you see them start casting about. And that's when you start seeing good management versus not necessarily visionary management, is imagining that happen. So you can be assured that, it, particularly in large corporations, they hire economists to monitor that kind of information and help make predictions about what does the future hold. And I can guarantee you there are economists out there in private corporate America, as well as in think tanks and in government agencies, who are watching you closely to see if you're going to get married and start, out, start having kids. They're not watching that closely, but they're keeping an eye on you, okay? So yeah. So changes in the, in the demographic makeup of the United States can have quite an effect. Here's another one. Let's talk about the fact that, that, that the number of people in the United States who are living below the median income. What's the median income? What does that mean? What is the median? It's the average, okay? Mode is the most common, right? Um, the median income in, in America today is $38,000, okay? Imagine the families living on less than $38,000. What, if anything, should we do to be able to raise their income up? Should we worry about trying to make those people capable of earning more money? Or should we say, send if they don't want to work harder, it's their problem. What do you think? Teach them how to build resumes. Say again? Teach them how to build resumes. Teach them how to build resumes. Well, for a lot of them, in my personal experience especially, uh, it's not just that they can't build a resume, they can't really write very well, and they don't have much in the way of skills, or experience, or education. And I'm not sure what we do to, to fix that. I, very quick note, and I may have to edit this out. I spent uh, yesterday, part of yesterday, reading through a public relations report prepared by some University of Florida graduates about my Kiwanis Club. We managed to trick them into doing a research project for us. So I'm reading this 28-page report about who, who joins nonprofit groups, who likes to volunteer, what are Kiwanis about, how attractive would that be, how do you market that kind of club? And i got to tell you something. Those people can't write. There were more either errors or typographical mistakes in that report than I have ever imagine, and these are from UF graduates in one of the better PR programs in the country. So I'm concerned that there's a lot of people out there that can't write. But back to my point, what do we, what do, we do, if anything, about these people who are not productive, who cannot earn enough money right now to be able to push up closer to the median? Should we be concerned with them, or should we say, well, that's kind of an inevitability you know, when you get paid on your product based on your productivity, some people are less productive, they're going to lead lower standards of living. And the thought that occurs to me is a phrase I've used before in this course. It's called producers and parasites. Do you remember the, the thesis of that phrase? What was, it, what was the reasoning behind that phrase? Producers and you know, at the end of your life and my life, each one of us on balance is going to have been either a producer producing more than we consume, or a parasite, consuming more than we produce. There's a book out called Makers and Takers, same concept. You have people who make, producers, and you have people who take, parasites, okay? If you look at that bottom level of the population distribution, 
and you see that it is not improving and maybe it's even getting bigger, and you say, not my problem, we're always going to have those kind of people in society, I think maybe you're overlooking something. That to the extent that you can, in some reasonable fashion, help them move up the income ladder, what does that do to the economy, the society? It creates more customers. It creates more spending. It creates more jobs. And so there's a line, right? You can go too far and you can give away too much to people and give them a disincentive to work. And I've met some people like that. I'm sure maybe you have too. But I've met a lot of others that given a halfway decent break, if they'd had a decent education, a decent home life, people would be making two and three times more money than they're making today. And they'd be paying a hell of a lot more taxes too. So just a concept. And this is particularly a macroeconomic perspective. When we get into people arguing about worthless people who don't work, why are we giving them welfare? I understand that for the ones that don't want to do anything, but recognize that to the extent you can help any of them move up, that's not just a, a good Samaritan action, that's in your and my self-interest too, to see more people more productive to make this economy stronger, so you and I can sell them the junk we want to. That was just a side thought. Has anybody read the article on the Great Depression? No? Yeah. What, what do you remember from it? There's a lot of information. There's what? There's a lot of information. It's a good bit. A lot we covered in the past, too. We have at times. Stockbrokers make too much money. Stockbrokers make too much money. Did, did we, didn't we use a term in this class, or did we churning? What is churning with regards to a stockbroker? It's someone who's managing your money who keeps buying and selling stock, telling you they're doing you a favor, but they're picking up a commission on it. And those guys definitely are overpaid, without ethics, okay? But tell me what margin buying was in the, great, in the period leading up to the Great Depression. Margin buying. You put 10% down. On what? On... Um, investments and then I'm buying. Consumer investments, consumer savings. You go to your stockbroker and you say, I want to buy $1,000 worth of stock. And he says, well, if you'll put 10% down, only $100, I can loan you the other 900. This is a loan from your broker. And you now have a margin account. And your margin account is basically your debt. Okay? 10% was the margin requirement in the late 20s going into the Depression. And the economy was doing pretty well. And stock prices were going up some. And more people began to learn about this. Not sophisticated investors, just, you know, Joe Smith running his little car repair place. And he found out if he could just come up with $100, he could have $1,000 worth of stock, which was really good if it went to $2,000. Because if in three months, four months, six months, he had $2,000 worth of stock, what could he do with it? He could sell it, pay back his loan over here, pay back mom, who he borrowed the $100 from, and now he's got $1,000 of his own. What can he do with $1,000? Buy ten thousand dollars worth of stock, and if you just just iterate that one more time, he buys ten thousand dollars worth of stock by borrowing nine and putting up one. And if that happens to double to twenty thousand, how much has he made? He's made ten thousand dollars clean profit. I mean, he's going to be paying interest on this margin account, but it's very low, very small. As this began to catch on, what do you suppose happened in the market? More and more people got into this, and as more and more people began to buy stock, prices went up. As prices went up, they looked at themselves in the mirror and said, I'm a freaking genius. Look at what I did. Just me. And what do you suppose they did? They went back out and you know sold it off, 
leveraged it out, borrowed it out again, loaned it out again, and boom, boom. Prices go up like crazy. Now, what's the difference between the term investment versus the term speculation? When you're investing, you're investing in the value of the item, and over speculation is when the value of the item is, I don't know how to put it in words, but like it's what's been it, um, invested or like borrowed for stocks is now higher than the value of the. That's well said. That the price of the stock goes up above its intrinsic natural value. What drove that price so high? It's what we call the theory of the greater fool. That is, I'll buy this even at a ridiculously high price if, the, if I think there's a bigger fool than me who will buy it later at an even higher price. That's speculation. It's when you drive the price of a product way up above its intrinsic normal economic value. And we saw this happen in the great, with a stock market crash. A great, a great deal of it fueled by 10% margin buying. Today, margin is up at 50%. We'll see more about that as we get a little deeper in the course, but this tends to slow down a lot of that speculation. Okay? Um, anybody here familiar with the term short selling? What is short selling? When you short a stock, you bet against it. Good. If I, if I found a stock... And just picking one at random, let me call it General Electric. Anybody know anything about General Electric these days? They're going to hell in a handbasket. They just cut their dividend from 12 cents a share to a penny a share, effective in January. If you saw, let's take General Electric, let's assume it's selling for $100 a share, and you begin to see that, oh, they're in trouble. That stock's going to drop. I know it's going to happen. What you do is you go borrow... Oh, borrow a thousand shares from your stockbroker. I just want to hold them. And then you sell them. And so you get $100,000. And then in three weeks, when the price has dropped to $20, then you go buy it for $20,000. So you paid $20,000 out, but you made $100,000 on the sale, and you net $80,000 on the drop of a stock on the fact that the stock lost value. Sound pretty good? It's excellent unless what? Unless the stock price goes up, then you gotta go buy it back to repay the stock. So there are a lot of ways to play the market. The one we're concerned with with the Great Depression was of course speculation and margin buying, but it brings to mind this idea of uh, a market bubble. We'll do a little bit more of this on the next test, too. But a market bubble is when asset prices move into the speculative price range. It's when prices on something go up super high and you know it's higher than the intrinsic worth. This happened with tulips back in, I think, the 1600s. People were buying tulips because they thought they were really a good investment and in going up in value. And of course, they began to buy so many of them, they drove the prices through the roof and then the market crashed. This happened with stocks in the 1930s, 1920s. It happened with houses. Remember that? In 2007, we had the beginning of the Great Recession when the stock market collapsed. Because prior to 2007, December 2007, what were people doing with houses? You ever read about that? You would put your house out on the market and say, you know, you, you bought the house for, say, $40,000, and you put it out and you thought, maybe I could get sixty. And you woke up that next morning and there's nine people standing outside by the for sale sign waiting for you to come outside, literally. And you came out and said, what do you all want? Somebody says, I'll give you 64 on your house. Next guy to him says, I'll give you 65. And they were raising prices that fast. People were buying houses that fast. Why? The theory of the greater fool. I'll pay you $80,000 for the damn house if I think tomorrow or next week I can flip it for 90. 
And so housing prices went crazy as well. Now there's a, a term in economics. When, once a price gets driven up by that, like that by speculation, at some point, somebody who's either afraid or smart or both looks around and says, this is crazy. This is crazy. No, I'm not going to buy it at that price. Matter of fact, I'm going to sell everything I got because I don't think prices can go much further up. And if the smart people start selling off stuff, what happens to prices? Start falling. And if the pretty smart people look at that and go, oh, damn, and they start selling off, prices fall faster. And if you know, dumb people like me look around and say, whoa, damn, if I haven't lost my shirt yet, I'm going to sell everything I got, and prices go driving in the basement. And so you get this huge plummet. This moment in time up here when, when people finally look around and go, this is crazy, and the prices start dropping. In economics, we have a term for that. A man earned everlasting fame. It's called the Minsky moment. Also known as the ODAM, or plug in any word you want. ODAM, here it goes. Okay? When do we know we hit the Minsky moment? After it's happened. Just like recognizing a recession. Don't know it till you've been there for six months to be certain, right? Probably suspected it, believed it earlier. Okay. Read that article on the Great Depression. There are six factors explained in that article that contributed to the Great Depression. One of them was margin buying and the stock market collapse. One of them was bank failures. One of them was the Dust Bowl. Anybody here heard of the Dust Bowl before? An agricultural drought. Have you ever seen any pictures from the Dust Bowl? You would literally have a tidal wave, 100 feet in the air, of dirt come flying in over your farm. And just like snow, once it passed, you'd walk back outside and stuff's covered up in dirt. Can't grow anything on that. When you can't grow anything as a farmer, how do farmers operate financially, at least historically? They borrow enough money from the bank to put the crop in. If the crop matures and they sell it, they, they take, pay their loans off, they take the money that's left, and they live on it, and if they had a really good year or a lot of land, maybe they got rich. But if you borrowed the money and put in the crop, and then you had a drought, you had no crop to sell, and you had a loan to pay, and that's when you lost the farm. And that's the old phrase, he lost the farm. That means he lost everything he's got. Who were the Okies? Ever heard of the Okies? These are the people from out of the Midwest, Oklahoma, et cetera, who, as they lost their farms, packed up everything they could on their, their old truck and drove to California to start, start a new life. And some of the historical black and white pictures of those families, small children, making their way across middle America are really, really shocking, sad. So you've got those factors and some others on the Great Depression. Be sure you're familiar with those. Okay, what else on your mind, anybody? Those are the points I wanted to cover today. This is the last shot before the exam. Uh, again, to remind you, Friday the campus is closed, so the exam will be open through Wednesday. And I will try to get this video posted this afternoon. Anybody? Anything? You talked about um, people, parasites, right? Yeah. You kind of hinted, but you didn't really give a, 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 a real answer. Like, what would you as... <laughs> Um, an economics teacher say is the solution besides saying F you, you don't work hard enough. Have you heard the phrase, on one hand there's this and on one hand there's that? Mm -hmm. When you ask an economist a question like that, you realize he's got 17 hands. On the one hand this, well maybe that, and on the other hand this, and we ought to consider that, there's 14 to 17 answers. And I'm being facetious. 
But the fact is, I may have some ideas that I think are worthwhile, and I, I do, but I know that they are not complete answers, and I know there are going to be good parts and bad parts to that solution. Do you ever think there's going to be a complete answer to that question? No. I think that, I think that A, we need capitalism as a, as a background or basis for our economic operation. And in capitalism, you're always going to have winners and losers. And I'm, I'm very comfortable accepting that. I, all, I may have to take this completely out of the video. I also believe that capitalism is not the total answer. That capitalism is very unfair at times, and we need to step in collectively to mitigate some of that. Unemployment compensation is a great example. That if you lose your job because the economy changes, we'll help you out until you can get another job. I think we maybe like Germany should say, and while we're helping you out, you're going to get some training. We're going to make you take some school or learn how to do this. But those are the kinds of mitigations to the capitalist swings I think we need. When it comes to people who are stuck in what we call the permanent underclass, the last textbook we used used that phrase quite a bit. Who do you suppose the permanent underclass is? The east side of East side of Gainesville is a good solution, but it's not just the east side of Gainesville, it's anywhere outside the city limits of Gainesville, all around. What's, what do we mean by the permanent underclass? We're talking about fourth generation poverty. We're talking about families whose children are growing up as the fourth generation stuck in a poverty level existence. Okay? And why is that happening? Dysfunctional families, single parent families, absentee fathers, domestic abuse, there's part of it, okay, all of that. Poorly funded schools, maybe poorly paid teachers who are unmotivated and kind of fed up with the behavioral problems of some of the children in school. We have a school here in Gainesville called Terwilliger Elementary that is under review now for having been an F school one year and maybe becoming an F school this year on the FCAT or whatever the hell they call it now. And they're talking about closing that school. That school is, is short six teachers because nobody wants to teach over there. Because you can't control the kids. And imagine this, I'm gonna hire you as a teacher and I'm gonna give you a bonus or not, or maybe fire you based on how your students do on the FCAT. What are you thinking? Please, God, let me have good kids, right? Because if you've got poorly performing children, for whatever reason, who cannot perform up to grade level, what's going to happen to you, the teacher? Under that regime, you're going to either lose your job or have your pay cut or some way you're going to be punished. Do you want to go teach in those low performing schools under those conditions? I don't think so. Not for a lot of teachers. So I think there's another part of the problem. I think our, I don't know about you, you went through it. I finished high school in 1966, and I got a damn fine education. I see some kids coming out of school today with excellent high school educations. Public school, even, as much as I tease about them. Gainesville High School, my kids went there, and they got a first-rate high school education. So it's there. But I think also there's about 30% or 40% of the students going through high school who are not getting any education at all and are just being simply passed along. And they're coming out of school illiterate, enumerate, can't, can't function. So are there some solutions? Yeah, the, some of them aren't cheap and some of them require some accountability. When I see, uh, or I've got a friend, a kid who's Parents are not involved with them at all. Okay, the kid's never at school or he's late to school all the time, he's truant all the time, and the parents don't give a damn. I've got a solution for that too. But I'm not sure how to do it. I'd like to punish the parent for that. But I'm afraid the parent's going to turn around and punish the child. So I don't know how to deal with that exactly. But I would like to make that parent more accountable. I grew up in an era in the military as well that Twice a year, one of my parents had to ride the school bus. And every day you got on the school bus, somebody's parent was sitting there. And you, by God, didn't screw up. And in the military, if I screwed up, 
I may, may get called to the principal's office, but the school will send a note to my father's commanding officer, who will then call my father in and say, Colonel Strickland, what's your problem with your son there? He seems to be out of line. Are you not capable of managing your family? How'd you like your boss to say that to you? That will be reflected on your evaluation. I think that's a damn good system. I got told, I learned from age seven, don't you screw up. Because if daddy has to go to see his boss, he's going to take it out of you. There's so, are some of my solutions, okay? Anybody else got some ideas? Permanent underclass, what do we do for them? I'm a believer, by the way, in universal health care. I think everybody in this country should have health care because we're wealthy enough to afford it. I think also if you did that, that consistency of health care would improve performance by that bottom permanent underclass, most of whom we're already paying for now for health care. Not all, but most. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, not the first time I saw it, but uh, I saw some city in California is paying homeless like 15 bucks an hour to uh, pick up trash, like up to five hours a day. That's cool. I love that. Well, we did it in the Depression. Go rake leaves, come get your check, and now, now you're spending money. I'm pretty sure in California, like this, I don't know about Florida, that... Um, schools get funded based on the value of properties. Most of school funding comes from a school tax, which is based on property values. So, if low income, like properties, like areas where there is low income, there's no money. There's no money, so those schools are never going to perform well because they have no funds. Well, those schools are never going to perform well as long as you rely on that property tax base. And so, again, part of my solution is you've got to change your your tax base. That's not very effective. What would you say about people in poverty and the argument that they should seek out mentorship to put them at the next level? I completely agree with it. I absolutely agree that they need some sort of mentorship, guidance, etc. I don't know exactly how you structure it, nor do I know how you pay for it. Well, I'm not saying so much as paying for it, but um, encouraging them to go, like say, I live on one side of town, and I know the other side of town, you know, produces more, you know, aware people. Okay. Putting the personal responsibility on the child to maybe put himself on the other side of town during the day around people that he knows are going to go, he or she, sorry, is uh, gonna, are going to go ahead in life instead of staying around people that are going to drag them down and then kind of putting that on. Let me ask you to pause just for a minute. Did we do the exercise where I asked you to write down the names of your five closest people. I don't know if you were here at the time. I said, write down the names of the five people you spend most of your time interacting with in your life. Just their first name, put it in your mar in the margin. Nobody will ever see it. List those five people and then give them each a score of zero to ten. Zero means they're sorry, they're drug dealers, they're pimps, whatever. And ten means they're the most wonderful, encouraging, mentoring people you could ever imagine. And when you look at the five people you spend your most time, most of your time with, you're going to wind up right in the middle of that crowd because we become like the people we hang around with and like the information we put in our head. So I'm a thousand percent behind having people in that circumstance become associating more with better role models, better influences. I'm not sure mechanically how to go about making Instagram. that happen. Huh? Instagram. How? Um, instead of following rappers, follow. Um, but how do you make them do that? How do you coerce them? Right in front of you. you. don't have to make them in front of you. Like go on your search feed and. Yeah, but but how do I get them to go on their search feed and go find better rooms? Personal will, like them yeah, personally wanted to. Yeah. Personally, how do they know better? Sometimes for better. They know better. My Kiwanis Club goes out to a couple of the elementary schools here, and we read to students, and we have them read to us. We run as mentors to middle schools, and it's that one-on-one -on -one interaction we can see making a difference. But if those kids were not coerced, ordered, whatever, to come to those programs, I'm not sure how much we would get. And even then, we're only getting 10% of them because we haven't got enough of us. So I, we're in agreement on what needs to be done, but I don't know how you force that to happen. I was going to say, I think it's really more 
upon the people who want to be mentors to go and reach out to them, not them to come to mentors, because I don't think they would, because they're accustomed to their way of life and they don't know any different. So, but you you feel the burden should be placed on not the, the burden, but I feel like for that interaction to occur, yeah, I think it's going to happen. It's more likely to happen if the mentors go and reach out to them, like Boys and Girls Club, Kiwanis. I completely that. agree with you because absent some other outside force coming into those people's lives, who do you think their five best friends or closest friends are? People in the same circumstance, and they tend to drag each other down. So yeah. Do you ever remember something called busing students to school? Up until 1954, America was divided. Its school districts were divided into black schools and white schools. And in 1954, Supreme Court case Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court said calling those schools equal and therefore acceptable is not constitutional that you must allow integration. And then they began to check on you, the federal government, check on your schools and say, in your school, what's the mix of African-American versus white versus whatever? And if you didn't have enough of, of a mix, they would literally bus kids from East Gainesville to View Holtz High School. And you can imagine the trauma when that first began. I mean, we had race riots, but in the late 60s and through 70s, a lot of kids got bus to school. They had to take a long one-hour bus ride each way every day. But your school populations became much more mixed, and you had that change, if you will, in environment, role models, communication, and et cetera. Over time, we have gone back. We now have predominantly black, predominantly white schools. We have gone, in that sense, back towards the 1950s. And that's where part of that cycle of poverty, that permanent underclass, is coming from. Would you say that's natural, or do you say, would you say that's like caused by um, society? I think, I think everybody wants to be around people like them. So in that sense, it's natural. But I think that, and, and society is a contributing factor to that. But I don't think society understands what the cost is of allowing that segregation to reoccur. That we don't appreciate one another for our differences, where you come from, etc. I think it's a sad thing. We're all in this boat together. We don't learn to get along together and work together. The idea of you going to be a rugged individual all by yourself, those days are pretty well gone. Think about that every time you get in your car and you drive down the road. Did you build that road? No, we did. Collectively, out of our money. We built a lot of things that a lot of us take for granted. So, I worry about that. I worry about where that ethic is going. Other comments? Questions? Anybody here? Go ahead. Oh, it was just about one of the readings. The sure. poem. Can you kind of summarize that? Like, I get the idea. What was the poem about? It was about the six blind men and Seven. the elephant. Seven. Seven blind men and the elephant. By Rudyard Kipling. Mm -hmm. And what was Mr. Kipling describing? He was describing seven very well-respected scholarly people who were all blind and who went to see an elephant, see, quote. And so how did they see the elephant? By touch. And each of them was touching different parts of the elephant, and each of them, based on his experience, described exactly what an elephant was. And none of them was correct. Each of them was only a partial truth. What's the point of that? Why would I put a poem about an elephant and blind men in a macroeconomics course? Because I'd had too many martinis one night. Okay. Because when you think of the classical model, that's one view of the economy, but it's not a complete view. It's got some problems. And when you look at the Keynesian model, 
That's another point of view, and if you understand the first one and combine it with the second one, you have a, a better understanding, but it's not a complete view either. And we'll see, for the last part of this course, we'll talk about a couple of other points of view. At, at the point of the poem is, you and I are never capable of understanding everything if we just keep a limited perspective. So flipboard in your readings, read from all the spectrum. You know? If you're not reading stuff in the news that absolutely irritates you and you think those people are idiots for writing it, you're not being fair to yourself. You need to be exposed to those alternative viewpoints. That's the point of the poem. Anything else? Um, how, how many of you here are contemplating taking the exam before the weekend? Anybody? One or two? Um, if you want to, when you finish the exam, if you feel like it, drop me a line. How do you think it went? I'm curious to see your response to this exam because I've taught the material not from the textbook. All of the questions are mine, not from the textbook. And I really would like your feedback on, given what we've covered, was this a reasonable exam? Okay. I'm hoping some of you are going to write back and say, that was the easiest exam I've ever seen because I really understand this stuff. But maybe, maybe I'll be crying in my beard. You tell me. Okay? What are you gonna do for Monday? Some of you are gonna get ready for the test. Yeah, okay. Pick up the next chapter and connect. Okay? We'll be going back to text. Huh? I think it's going to say it's November 6th or something. Could be. I don't remember. Okay? Have a great weekend. Hope you do well on the test. Take care.